In 2023, five people were thought to be trapped 10,000 feet under the cold, dark ocean in a little submersible without power. The now infamous story of the tight submersible would ultimately end in tragedy, but it's not actually the first incident of its kind. In the 1970s, there was another eerily similar situation. And this is that horrifying story. Today's video is sponsored by Babbel, one of the top language learning apps in the world. If you're a longtime subscriber, you probably know about how I took French in school for many, many years, but then forgot basically all of it because I wasn't using it. This was so discouraging because it took so much time and effort to learn in the first place. This is why I was super excited when Babbel reached out. Babbel's intuitive lessons are designed by over 650 real language teachers and put together in a way that makes it fun and easy to learn. And it can prepare you to have actual conversations about relationships, travel, and all sorts of things. Babbel does this by being like your very own personal language coach and taking you through language lessons in a variety of different ways. Like matching words with definitions, spelling words out, using the correct grammar, and even practicing your pronunciation just like this. Fair de la plonge. Fair de la plonge. And not only does it accelerate your learning and enable you to have real-world, practical conversations, but they just added an incredible AI conversation tool that allows you to have a full conversation and practice everything you've learned. For example, check out this recent conversation I had. And this conversation was all done conveniently from the Babbel app on my phone. So if you're curious to give Babbel a try, click on my link below or scan the QR code on screen now to get 60% off your Babbel subscription. Et maintenant, le video d'aujourd'hui. That means, and now, today's video. Not too long ago, the world's attention was fixed on a situation in the middle of the North Atlantic Ocean when a submersible, traveling to the wreck of the Titanic, began to hit news channels. It's now an infamous story with a terribly tragic ending, and the assumed scenario of the Titan's submersible in 2023 as events were unfolding was the stuff of nightmares. Five people were thought to be crammed into a small vessel that was without power and was stuck on the bottom of the ocean in complete darkness, tens of thousands of feet below the water. But even worse, it was thought to have a limited supply of air that was dwindling with every passing minute. It was a literal race against time to recover the submersible that turned into an international effort to rescue those aboard. News outlets even displayed countdown clocks that crept closer and closer to zero, which were supposed to indicate when the five aboard would run out of air. Meanwhile, expert after expert gave insight into just how challenging and improbable of a rescue effort this was. When those countdown clocks finally ran out, an underwater remote camera arrived at the scene and confirmed that the submersible had likely suffered a catastrophic implosion during its descent, contrary to what was initially thought. For many of us who were glued to news sources for any updates over those five days or so while the fate of those aboard was in question, there was no real point of reference for anything like this. It was almost like a movie script playing out in front of our eyes. But for some people, this was not the first incident of the kind they'd seen play out. In 1973, Roger Mallinson was a 35-year-old engineer working on a Canadian commercial submersible called the Pisces III. Alongside him was 28-year-old Roger Chapman, and the pair were working on a job for the U.S. Postal Service to lay transatlantic telephone cable into the seabed about 150 miles southwest of Cork, Ireland. And while Chapman in particular was a submariner for the Royal Navy at one time, manning a submersible is a bit different. For one, these are often smaller vessels. The Pisces III they were working on measured 20 feet or 6 meters long by 7 feet or about 2 meters wide and about 11 feet or 3 meters high. This is almost identical to the dimensions of the Titan submersible. Submarines that he was used to are also much larger ships that are often powered by something on board, so they can enter and leave port on their own and operate independently in the ocean. Submersibles, on the other hand, often have limited power. They can operate independently for a time, but rely on a mothership that both launches and recovers them. Now, due to this size difference, Mallinson and Chapman were working together in close quarters, but luckily, the two men got along extremely well, which is a plus considering the work itself was dull and exhausting. For the duration of their eight-hour shifts, they'd move along the seafloor at half a mile per hour, stirring up mud and burying cable. Visibility would become extremely poor as the mud became unsettled, but regardless, whoever was piloting at the time would have to devote complete concentration to ensuring they were following as straight a line as possible. 
It was mind-numbing work, and for Mallinson, on Wednesday, August 29, 1973, it was made all the worse by a lack of sleep. An earlier dive had damaged something on the Pisces 3, so beginning the previous day, he spent 26 straight hours fixing it. During this time as well, he performed some regular maintenance, which included changing out the oxygen tank. The existing tank was still about half full, and the protocol for a half full tank was to leave it installed, but since sleep was out of the question anyway, Mallinson figured he'd just put in a fresh tank. Just after 9. 15 that morning, the shift was coming to an end for the pair and the Pisces 3 surfaced. All Mallinson could think of was just how much he was looking forward to getting some rest, but as they were waiting for a tow line to be attached that would bring the submersible aboard the mothership, one of the hatches was accidentally opened before it was safe. Water then began pouring into the self-contained portion of the Pisces 3 and the submersible was suddenly pulled backward by the excess weight, flipping the vessel upside down. And although they were still safely secured inside and separated from the section that was flooding, Mallinson and Chapman were tossed around as the submersible started to sink fast. Now rocketing toward the ocean floor at almost a vertical angle, the two men aboard started releasing about 400 pounds or 180 kilos of lead weight, but this did little to slow their descent. They also shut down all the electrical systems and flipped off the depth gauge as it could have burst with how fast they were falling. Then, about 30 seconds after the hatch was opened on the surface, the Pisces 3 slammed into the seabed at around 40 miles or 65 kilometers per hour. When it finally settled upside down, Mallinson and Chapman were trapped 1, 575 feet or 480 meters below the surface of the ocean in pitch black darkness. This also began a clock, much like that of the Titan submersible, of how much air the men had before they ran out. It would now be a race to save them before they suffocated. As everything went deathly quiet, one of the men took out a flashlight and flicked it on. They checked each other over and miraculously neither of them was injured. Surrounding them however were parts and pieces of the submersible that had dislodged either during the descent or from the hard impact with the seafloor. Meanwhile at the surface, a frantic effort began to try to rescue the men but there was one significant obstacle to clear. No one in the submersible or at the surface knew where the Pisces 3 even landed. On the way down, a buoy line connected to the vessel snapped, which was vital in locating the sub and when the submersible came to rest on the seabed, it did so in a gully that was partially buried under mud and sediment. Thankfully, less than 30 minutes after the submersible sank, the surface was able to make contact with Mallinson and Chapman via the telephone. They would then inform the surface team that they were both fine and they were making preparations on their end doing whatever they could to figure out how to survive as long as possible hopefully long enough to be rescued. The surface team then let the men know that they didn't know where the Pisces 3 landed so they'd first have to locate them, which could take some time. When the call ended for the two men, their top priority was extremely clear. They would need to conserve as much oxygen as possible. In order to do that, they'd have to do nothing. No moving around, no talking, literally nothing. Mallinson also suddenly remembered that he changed out the auction tanks the day before and felt a brief moment of relief. Each tank was approximately 72 hours of air. After their Adar shift, they were down to 66 at the time of the accident, but had Mallinson not installed a new tank, they'd have very little time before they ran out. So, the two men then made themselves comfortable as high up in the flipped over submersible as possible and just lay in the darkness, trying to control their breathing rate. Every so often, one of them would reach over to the other and the two would grab each other's hands and squeeze as if to say they were okay. A little after 10. 30 a.m., a ship in the North Sea was contacted to return the Pisces 2, which was the sister ship of the Pisces 3, back to port so it could be transferred to the scene. The U.S. Navy was also reached and they immediately dispatched a submersible known as Curve 3, which would be transported to the scene by a Canadian Coast Guard ship. By 8 o'clock that night, Another mothership made it to Cork to pick up both the Pisces 2 and the Pisces V and set off for the site of the disabled Pisces 3 by 10. 30. This was just over 12 hours since the submersible slammed into the ocean floor. Below the ocean surface, the two men would then make it through the night, but the longer they were stuck in the submersible, the more dire the situation would become. Not only was the very real clock ticking down on the amount of oxygen they had left, but they had next to nothing in terms of food and water. Between the two of them, there was just one cheese sandwich and one can of lemonade, 
but they decide to save them both and hold out as long as they could without them. Luckily though, as time went on in the disabled submersible, they discovered that condensation was forming along the walls, and while it wasn't much, it at least gave them a bit of water. Every so often, once enough condensation built up, they'd lick the walls, which really only afforded them enough fluid to wet their dried mouths, but still, it was better than nothing. Then, in order to stretch their oxygen supply as much as possible, the men also allowed carbon dioxide to build up a bit more than normal. During regular operation of the submersible, a lithium hydroxide fan would need to be flipped on every 40 minutes or so to soak up and scrub the submersible of CO2. They still needed to do this, but they had to conserve things even more than usual. So while they waited in the dark, they'd use an egg timer they'd set to 40 minutes, and when it went off, they'd wait a little while longer before flipping on the fan. This caused them to become groggy and lethargic from the excess CO2 buildup, but again, they just had no other choice. Then, between trying to lap up as much condensation as possible and seeing how long they could go without a fresh burst of oxygen, they simply lay in the submersible with nothing but their thoughts to keep them occupied. During this, their main thoughts were about their families and wondered how they were reacting to the situation.